Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, very pleased to see you all here. And uh, I'm very glad that we come to Philippines to do the localized workshop, as I think it would be very appropriate for this uh, country where more, more candidates can attend our course on Zoom. So I hope you enjoy the program for the next two days organized by Alan and the faculties. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lee. We are inspired to become more adept in the endolab surgery. Now, to brief us today and for tomorrow's activity, I would like to call the course director of this program. He is the program director of the Unified Minimally Invasive Surgery Training. And the executive director of the Philippine Center for Advanced Surgery. Um, He's the executive committee of the Asia Pacific Hernia Society, immediate past president of the Philippine Hernia Society, past president of the Endoscopic and Laparoscopic Surgeons of Asia, advisory board member, Asia Pacific Endolap Surgery Group, board of director of the Asia Endosurgery Task Force, editorial board of the Asian Journal of Endoscopic Surgery. The, it's actually the official publication of ELSA an international faculty of IRCAT Taiwan and the board of director of the Philippine Association of Laparoscopic and Endoscopic Surgeons. May I please call on Dr. Alfred Allen Buenafe. Thank you, Alex. Uh, before we give you the overview of the workshop for today, uh, which will be given by Ray, uh, I'll be just giving you a history, brief history of APELS. Uh, we'll be celebrating our 10th year anniversary at the end of this year. So it's a big celebration for APELS. Uh, if you would notice, there's a lot of programs right now for APELS. Uh, it's really a project uh, coming off for uh, the celebration of our 10th year. APELS actually is the brainchild of Michael Lee. And uh, I'm actually one of the babies of Michael. <laughs> I started off as a student, and he was the one who invited me to do a lecture first in Asia, and uh, it's because of his work that we are all here together. Uh, all the faculty that you can see today is the product of Michael, a, a stupid idea, right? <laughs> and uh, you're, you're now getting the fruit of that uh, crazy idea of Michael. Uh, it's Michael also's idea of combining endoscopy and laparoscopy. Uh, he has a lot of papers on this one. And that's why we're so proud of giving it to you. The idea of this workshop is just an introduction for general surgeons to take up upper GI surgery, laparoscopic upper GI surgery, and laparoscopic colon surgery in, in such a way that we, all of us, learned uh, from him. So we're trying to give uh, the fruits that we uh, were able to experience from him and share it to our local uh, students. Uh, all of you were... Uh, chosen because you're one of the leaders in your institution and hopefully you'll be the future leaders also and the future teachers for your students and that's the whole idea of this thing so to give off on we would like first to thank michael for giving us this opportunity and of course our current faculty from simon Hong Ching Yip, our local faculty ray dawn and of course rona rona is our friend from the uh, uh physician friend from gi uh, she'll be doing a very good lecture on HRM, uh, which is, I think, it's now very important for us to understand, especially if you're dealing with a upper GI diseases. Uh, we don't do our upper GI diseases surgeries anymore without any HRM. Uh, at the moment, there are only two institutions in the Philippines offering HRM, St. Luke's and uh, La Salle, and hopefully we'll have more. Uh, we actually have now one HRM. We'll show you the machine later on, it's the newest one for Medconic. So hopefully we'll be able to come up with a uh, active uh, upper GI surgeries in, in the Philippines. So I'll give the floor to uh, my co-course director, uh, Dr. Ray Sarmiento, also one of the board of APELS, Ray. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ben. Thank you, Dr. Benafe. Um, so today, um, We'll just give you, um, I'll just give you a course of what will happen today and then tomorrow. So today will be 
a series of lectures uh, with regards to end up OR, achalasia, functional GI diseases, and uh, later on in, in the afternoon with the lower GI diseases. And we have here uh, a set of faculties from uh, the Chinese University of Hong Kong and uh, locally from um, uh, all over the country, from Manila to down to Sydney. And um, after that, we will have some stations in the laboratory. Uh, it will be a, like a digital, some would be digital stations or uh, computer-aided stations, and then uh, we'll do uh, tomorrow for your MIS part. Uh, and hopefully, we are able to impart to you the flexible and the labs to be part of your general surgery services or your practice in general surgery so you can be able to deliver quality care to your patients or surgical care to your patients. And we'd like to, to thank Professor Michael Lee, Professor Simon Ng, uh, Professor Lee, as mentioned by Dr. Allen, uh, uh, when, we, when I started training, uh, he was with uh, Professor Sidney Chung when they came here. Sidney Chung, Samuel Kwok, and uh, Angus Chan. There was, that, was, that was the first time I met them when uh, that was uh, <laughs> that, uh, just the ELSA here in Manila. And Professor Lee is the founder of uh, ELSA, actually. One of the founders of ELSA. Simon Ng is the chairman of the department of the Chinese University of Hong Kong and uh, Professor Hon Chi Yip is uh, from, uh, do we call it Team 2 Surgery? Or we call it Upper GI and Metabolic Surgery Service of the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, Hon Chi was a student. I was a, still a medical student, so <laughs> I was a fellow then. Uh, <laughs> Professor Simon Ng was a, a senior MO during that time. So uh, with, uh, of course, uh, Dr. Allen, benefits blessing. We welcome you. I hope you enjoy your your stay with us until tomorrow. Hopefully, it will be a fruitful one. Okay, thank you. So, um, yeah, I'll pass the mic on to Alex. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Ray and Dr. Allen for that kind introduction. Okay. Okay. To so let's start. So, to start off with our opening lecture on Endolap OR, may I call on Professor Michael Lee. Professor? Well, good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. That's uh, time flies. PCAS is now 10 years old. And this was the picture taken that I have recollection of uh, that wonderful day. And, uh, and I was with... Uh, the one in the white top is Kitano, and also you can see next to the Cardinal is David Lomento. We have all been here to uh, participate at the start of this wonderful center. Let me get on to my lecture today. Endolab OR. I'm introducing the idea of an OR setting for endolab work. It's a bit of history. Um, minimum access surgery, right? This is what we've been dreaming of, reducing the trauma to the patient. Actually, I don't use this, it's even better. My voice is loud enough. MAS. We always thought about laparoscopic surgery is MAS surgery. Why not endoscopic surgery? It's because endoscopic surgery has taken an even earlier kickoff than laparoscopic work. Nowadays, a lot of the surgical operations that we used to do are taken over by endoluminal surgery, which is like ulcer bleeding, polyps, and uh,
typical example that has developed over the last few years is combination of endoscopy and laparoscopy. So for two years, the first three successes of that drive program teach the results of the heart endoscopy. Now these first ten days in the school is in turn followed by that of focus research. That's the first MD three of the first five of the first six of them turn out. Of course, all techniques have their own limitations. So thought came along to me that why can't we find the techniques for our purposes? In treating our patients. And that's how the endo lab concept came along. Because previously, as you know, 20 years ago, you want to do endoscopy in your OR, it's very different. You have to get the nursing staff to push the trolley in and then set it all up and all that. So I actually approached Olympus. I said, You've got a good laparoscopic system, you've got a good endoscopic system. Why cannot we put it in one setting? in the OR setting. And that idea came about, and I built the first uh, uh, endo lab OR in 2005 with, with, uh, with the engineering support. So this is a uh, first random mild trial that we did in our hospital for the obstructing left side that colorectal cancer. So uh, it was published almost 20 years ago. So the concept endo lab OR is endoscopic surgery and laparoscopic surgery in the same sitting uh, for our patient. This is what we used to do in open surgery. And of course now we have a uh, laparoscopic operating theater, but the endo lab OR, the whole point is you can see here two systems. One is for laparoscopic, one is for endoscopic, all in the same sitting, and they have the technique of now what they call plug and play. That means the um, uh, uh, the instrumentation all same the same uh, receptor in the camera. And this is the uh, OR that we built in two o o five. And turn down the sound, please. Good turn on. Okay. Turn down the sound, please. So this was the artist concept of how this could be done. So basically, uh, this was designed for the surgeon's benefit, the availability of equipment at the same sitting of for laparoscopic surgery and endoscopy. And also it's an easy operating theater setup. Benefit for theater staff, no need to wheel any bulky equipment in and out, no need for equipment connection or uh, because everything is off the sea on the ceiling. Facility is theater set up, easy to clean because no wires on the floor, everything is above and improve the pa uh, patient turnover. We actually did a study of the efficiency endo level uh, and published our figures back in two, year 2000 and uh, six, I think. And uh, these are the result of observation of using the endo level. Uh. So endo level, uh, Make it easier for surgeon, 
simpler for operating room staff, safer and better for patients. Of course, following years, we developed uh, also robotic surgery and we incorporated the robot into the second OR, which houses the endolab theater. Can you cut the sound off? Cut it off. Cut, it, cut. cut the sound. Automatic. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, what's wrong with the video? <laughs> anyway, this is, uh, we managed to build incorporating a robot with a 3D imaging operation into this robotic endolab. Uh, at that time, it was the first probably design in the world with this uh, accommodation of robot and, uh, 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 and also uh, uh, endolab uh, equipment. And you can see here, uh, operating on the robot, uh, we have a screen where observer can see the 3D images. So um, that came into being in 2009. It's really equipped to uh, to show uh, uh, live surgery demonstration as well. And uh, and this is the setup we're looking from outside. So this is, uh, at that time in 2018, we installed the Da Vinci. So for integrating operating theater for the future, uh, the goal is to provide the best environment for surgeon and the operating team. And definitely working condition improve without sacrificing safety, efficiency, and comfort. So the ultimate aim is to deliver better service to our patient with improved outcome. I think we need to continue innovate, develop, and improve and discover new frontiers to improve our patient's care. And that's the aim of our, uh, that's the aim. Thank you. Alex, uh, any questions for Professor Lee? Okay, so the setup, no, of course. Uh, <laughs> so the setup, I mean, it's very ideal and hopefully uh, at least in any training institution or training institution affiliated with PSGS, we'd like to have one or two and even all the ORs in the in a training institution to be an endolab OR. It, May not be a Da Vinci robot, but at least a robot uh, incorporated into the program. So, um, okay. So Alex will introduce me for my lecture. So I'll give him the mic. Chill and tie, chill. Okay. So thank you, Professor Lee, for that um, very wonderful lecture. Uh, uh, may I introduce our next uh, next lecturer? He's the head of the Minimally Invasive and Robotic Surgery Center in the St. Luke's Medical Center, Global City, the Fort Tagig. He's the training officer of the head of the Minimally Invasive Surgery Unit, head of the Hepato Pancreatico Biliary Surgery Unit, and program director of the, the SEMF, the Surgical Endoscopy and MIS Fellowship Program and the head of the section of the surgical endoscopy and consultant of the section of the general aba, no? general and laparoscopic surgery, surgical endoscopy at the Asian Hospital Medical Center, Philinvest. He's the board member of the Asia-Pacific 
Endolaparoscopic Surgery Group and a member and board director of the Philippine Association of Laparoscopic and Endoscopic Surgery. May I call on Dr. Ray Sarmiento to talk to us about the endoscopic and laparoscopic approach okay. on Akalisha, Dr. Ray. Thank you, Alex. So, I was tasked to take the first bite for today's lectures. And um, my topic will be on Akalasia, but uh, I will not touch on the other topics of our uh, colleagues here. So, I'll just touch on the general principles and uh, we'll show you some work that we do. And also, before I go on, uh, it's just a disclaimer, Alex. I'm head of, of the MIS Center of St. Looks and the robotic center for just administrative purposes. But um, the robotics part is for euro, colorectal, and the gynae people. So I just signed off some paperwork for the robot. <laughs> okay. So my topic would be achalasia, and we know it's a primarily esophageal motor disorder of unknown etiology. And there are two basic things with achalasia. One is loss of organized uh, peristalsis of the esophageal body, but the main uh, uh, diagnosis or clincher for achalasia will be there's impaired relaxation of the EGJ junction. You'd see lectures wherein it's OGJ because it's esophagus, oesophagus, uh, but uh, for our purposes, it's EGJ. And um, it's a rare disease, but actually, uh, as diagnosis for this disease uh, is improving and uh, locally we have uh, two units for high resolution manometry, one in St. Luke's uh, QC and BGC and one in De La Salle University, uh, we increasingly get patients for uh, with the diagnosis of achalasia or some functional uh, disorders of the upper GI tract. So it can... The, the etiology can be multifactorial, infection, autoimmune, or neurodegenerative. And if you see the incidence, it's 2 to 3 out of 100,000, but maybe not. So uh, maybe the data or the incidences will change as we go on improving and uh, looking for these patients. Maybe some of the patients that we see as GERD or diagnosed as GERD might be actually a functional disorder or uh, achalasia patient or a impaired peristalsis of an esophagus patient or uh, impaired relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. So the classic symptoms, dysphagia, regurgitation, vomiting, um, unintentional weight loss, and chest pain. But if you take notice, most of these patients that would go to your clinic, weight loss is very evident. And uh, another would be the their presentation of not dysphagia, but regurgitation of food that they ingested even a few days or a few weeks before. So uh, these are very uh, classic signs that when your patient presents with these symptoms, kindly think of, of course, ruling out esophageal, distal esophageal tumor, look for uh, achalasia patients. And uh, diagnostic tests, I will not deal on these things, uh, but basically there's this classic bird's beak in uh, barium swallow. And when you do endoscopy, there's uh, retained food and then the rosette appearance of the uh, G junction. And of course, uh, later we'll have a lecture on high resolution manometry, which is the gold standard for um, diagnosing achalasia. So there's no cure for achalasia. What we do is palliative surgery for achalasia. And the treatment is to uh, aim at symptomatic palliation of the dysphagia and the regurgitation. So there are therapeutic strategies. You can give uh, medical, endoscopic, or surgical treatment for these patients. And uh, if you see... Um, <clears throat> So uh, if the, if you use uh, sildenafil, maybe you'll notice that there's some regurgitation uh, after. So maybe it can be useful for achalasia. Calcium channel blockers, uh, endoscopic, 
can be can uh, can be a pendulum from the most minimal like a botox injection pneumatic balloon dilatation to peroral endoscopic myotomy poem will be dealt more in depth by professor honchi Yip. and uh, of course uh, on the other side of the pendulum will be surgical laparoscopic heller's myotomy or plus or minus fundo application but standard should be heller's myotomy plus a fundo application so for endoscopic treatment options uh, for Botox injection, uh, what we use here in the country is, uh, okay, the, sorry. So for the endoscopic management would be Botox injection, pneumatic balloon dilatation, POEM. POEM would be creating what we call a submucosal tunnel or uh, so that you'll be able to create this safety endoscopic mucosal flap and be able to do myotomy uh, under that tunnel or inside that tunnel. And basically, that's where I named my Surgical Endoscopy and Minimally Invasive Fellowship Program, SEMF, Submucosal Endoscopic Mucosal Flap. So uh, Botox injection, you uh, use uh, Botox to block the acetylcholine release from uh, the local nerve endings. Uh, you you put in. Uh, we use this uh, brand, the Neuronox. Neuronox. Uh, it's a Korean brand. Uh, we usually buy them off from our plastic surgery colleagues, and uh, we inject hundred units of Botox. I mean, it's uh, we dilute it five ml and then inject uh, per quadrant. And the average duration of uh, it's palliative effect would be around 6 to 12 months. Now would be uh, endoscopic balloon dilatation. But in this picture, you'll see it's a CRE balloon. Uh, that's just a representation. And the uh, pneumatic balloon is wherein you inflate a balloon using a pneumatic uh, a pressure um, inflator. And it's graded to 30, 35, and 40, meaning it's 30 millimeters, 35 millimeters, and 40 millimeters. Filipino population, 35 millimeters is my cutoff. I don't usually do a 40 millimeter uh, pneumatic balloon dilatation. And I'll show you later on a video. So this is how it really looks like, the balloon dilator. There are certain markers in that balloon. Those are radio-opaque markers that you'd see in fluoro. And uh, the pneumatic dilator or the inflator inflation device is just like your uh, sphygma manometer for um, uh, the blood pressure. And usually placed under, we initially place a guide wire and then put the balloon, dilate, and then it's fluoroscopy guided. And then later on, we check the dilatation if it's, uh, sometimes we do check, sometimes we do not. So the principle is basically like this. You want to disrupt the muscle layers so that there'll be uh, this uh, relaxation of that lower GE junction. So this is a lady. I, if I can remember, a 90-year-old 90, 90 lady. And we're able to pass through the scope, make sure that there's no tumor. And uh, we deem she's not a candidate actually for surgery. And... Uh, when I was assessing the tissues, I think she's amenable for a pneumatic balloon dilatation. Had it been that the tissues were, I mean, she's really poorly nourished and the tissues were um, too thin that I may cause more injury if I do pneumatic dilatation, I would just go for a Botox injection. So the classic bird beak, bird beak appearance on uh, fluoroscopy. Put a wire down there. And then we place in the pneumatic uh, balloon. And please take note that the things that we watch out for would be the markers. So the two lines will be where we place the G-junction and slowly inflate the balloon. The difference with this balloon and uh, what we call a controlled radial expansion balloon, uh, once you dilate this, it dilates maximally to the size that is intended for. Like it's 30, 30 millimeters. It's 35, 35 millimeters. 
So now you see that there's uh, this, I mean, an opening up of that distal esophageal sphincter. So uh, with this uh, uh, review, uh, systematic review, you'd see that at six months, those who had pneumatic dilatation had better response with Botox injection. Okay, now there's a, I just wanted to show you this size that the use of uh, PDE5 uh, inhibitors was associated with significantly less, um, statistically significant reduction in LES pressure. Maybe in some patients that uh, not fit for, or does not want to go into surgery, you may try uh uh, sildenafil or tadalafil or vardenafil but may have some issues later on with uh, yes you know that <laughs> so uh, okay so that can be a junk so uh, another in the middle, in the middle ground would be peroral endoscopic myotomy, first introduced by a professor Inoue in Japan. But actually, the concept came from what we call that submucosal tunneling uh, by the Apollo Apollo Group, and eventually was put into clinical use by uh, Professor Inoue. Professor Honchi Yip will uh, deal more on uh, this uh, third space endoscopy. Um, this is what we use for that um, lift or submucosal fluid lift, uh, HPMC, saline, a little bit of epinephrine, and uh, methylene blue. That's what's available in the country. But uh, we seldom use the epinephrine now because of Professor Inoue said, said that he, he does not use uh, epinephrine anymore. So it's just HPMC, saline, and... Uh, Method in blue. So I'll show you a series of videos with a, some series of poem works that we did locally. And uh, you'd see how we developed the, uh, the, the, the program or develop the technique as we go along the way. Because we were not trained to do this uh, during our training uh, as fellows in... Uh, surgical endoscopy. So we had to take courses to be able to, or workshops to be able to touch base this. So if you, you see, there's an initial injection of what we call a submucosal fluid cushion. And I've shown you that um, this is what we use as a fluid cushion. And then once that cushion is uh, there, we do a mucosectomy. So this is one of the Older videos that, I mean, older, one of the, sorry. Uh, initial patients that we had, in, if you can see the mucosectomy is vertical and not so accurate. We were still using a hook knife that we tried to borrow from uh, one of our friends uh, abroad because it was not available in the country. And then once that we go into that tunnel and create this uh, submucosal tunnel and we try to break off the areas until we reach or even cauterize the blood vessels until we reach the level of the G-junction where you can see also on the other side of the the esophagus is tightness in that area. So you know that you are in the area of the G-junction and also if you see these palisading vessels you know that you're in the G-junction but we do double check. We go in and out of the tunnel and into the lumen of the esophagus. And of course, uh, since this is one of our initial patients, we do encounter bleeding. We did not, I mean, the, the dissection was not as fine as you can 
uh, see later on when Hon Chi Yip would do this. And then we want to see that uh, submucosal tunnel inside the stomach, that uh, two to three centimeters there, and then uh, do the myotomy from inside of the tunnel. So initially we were doing a uh, once we were doing a um, full thickness uh, myotomy because uh, there's a plan after doing this. Uh, so thinking as a surgeon, we made the myotomy full thickness. So you can see the crudeness of the technique initially. So, but eventually we were able to fine tune it. But uh, I just want to show you a series of patients were in, uh, uh, were in uh, this patient helped us fine tune our technique. So you can see charring, burning. We were still uh, experimenting on the amount of energy that we use and even the knives that we use for endoscopy. So this is a myotomy. Uh, we will go. Uh, we are cutting now the circular masses, but we'd go for a full thickness later on. So as you can see, there's a increasingly a better dissection as we go throughout through the years. And that's basically how we are as surgeons. We develop the art of surgery along the way. But of course, what is important is you get training first. That's very important. Know the basics and then develop your artwork later on. Art is long, life is short. Okay, now after the full thickness myotomy uh, poem, we do not do any perihilar or peri uh, 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 dissection around the cruise of the diaphragm. We just do a Take out the fat layer there wherein we see that full thickness uh, myotomy after a poem and then do a modified DOR or door from duplication. So this is just three trocars and we try to suture that door, uh, that uh, fundus of the stomach into the right cruise. We made sure, uh, I made, I just make sure that the, the suture is tight and I'm not suturing uh, Tom Cruise. No, no. Joke only. So it's left cruise. We don't touch the right cruise anymore. Uh, sorry, the right cruise. We just suture the fundus. We don't touch the left cruise anymore or we don't dissect that. And um, basically, this is a 30-minute procedure right after a 30-minute to an hour poem procedure. But uh, you'd see later how Professor Honchi would develop or show you how an endoscopic fund application is done. So that's, uh, but if you can see as a general surgeon, not all of us are as adept or as technically skilled by our colleagues uh, outside the country. So if you are able to do an endoscopic procedure and do your laparoscopic procedure, then the endolap OR is very useful for you. So that's the take for what we, that's what we want to show you or want to deliver through APELS. So um, on the laparoscopy part, the laparoscopic Heller's myotomy, I'll show you a video of how it is really done. I thought initially when I was watching the video, I thought I was doing it. But I said, I do not do my suturing this way. This should be Allen's uh, Heller's myotomy. So uh, this is how it is properly done. Once you've done your full myotomy, You suture the one of the lip or the medial lip or of that myotomy to the right cruise. And then the medial lip or the I mean the lateral lip to the left cruise. So that it will keep open that myotomy. And then the mucosa is uh, bare open or laid open. And if you notice, this is a single port, right? Single port. 
Yeah, okay. I thought I was the one doing it. Eh. But it's very fast. So after uh, suturing that myotomy to the cruise of the diaphragm, uh, we get a portion of that fundus of the stomach. Either, if you ch if you see your stomach a little, I mean, floppy enough to be uh, uh, flipped over as a fundal application, uh, that would be good. If not, um, you can mobilize a little bit from the splenic flexure, I mean, from the spleen, the splenogastric ligament. Um, the purpose of the fundal application, number one, is to accentuate the angle of his. Accentuate the angle. So make an accent of that angle of his to prevent reflux disease. Because once you do your myotomy, definitely uh, one of the problems after that would be a reflux. So you need to accentuate the angle of his to uh, prevent reflux. So uh, Heller's myotomy versus per order endoscopic uh, myotomy. Um, 12 months for poem versus... Uh, so almost the same in terms of uh, outcomes for POEM and for Lap Heller's myotomy. The only problem with POEM would be the GERD part, um, uh, the reflux disease after uh, a POEM. With laparoscopic Heller's myotomy, you address the reflux part of that uh, Heller's myotomy. So I think uh, that would be my last slide. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, we go on later for our next lectures. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Ray. Any questions for Dr. Sarmiento? Uh, okay, Maya, you can ask questions. Huh? Maski, I know you can actually send your questions through small papers and then our moderator will be reading it out. Uh, sir, what uh, what sutures do you usually use for your fund application? Okay. Since I work in a government hospital, I would use Vicro. That's the only one available. But in a private setting, Etibond is the best to use because of its... Uh, it's uh, It doesn't have that memory. And then when you do your knot tying, even though your angulation or your... Uh, hands are not, so, I mean, in a difficult position, it's easier to do your knot tying with the uh, etiband because uh, that suture is uh, easy to handle compared to Vicryl or a proline that has high memory. So um, etiband is uh, actually the suture of choice for me when I do upper GI surgery or even fund applications. Thank you. Any other, uh, Dr. Allenbert? Absorbable or uh, an absorbable suture? Uh, doesn't it doesn't matter actually, as long as the absorbable suture holds on beyond uh, thirty days or four weeks. From our audience, shy pa, shy. Uh, Do we do on table endoscopy? Yes, we do. Yeah. Um. Uh, we try to check on the fullness of that myotomy. We put the endoscope down. Uh, so that's, again, the purpose of an endolap OR. While after doing, I mean, after doing your um, laparoscopic hairs myotomy, you check for that uh, full break or that uh, transillumination through the mucosa. And even, actually, an air leak test. And then that Dorfund duplication can actually help you once with that leak. Uh, I mean, with that uh, perforation of that mucosa, you can cover the perforation after suturing it primarily with the serosa of that uh, uh, Dorfund duplication. Maybe another question will be what type of fund duplication? Maybe once after Professor Honchi um, uh, finishes his lecture, we can actually ask him those questions because. Uh, 
I mean, we'll... <laughs> No, 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 no. I mean, the experience from Hong Kong would be also a, a good take in uh, take home for us, uh, local, and then uh, their experience in uh, other centers. Okay. Is the assistant professor uh, professor of the Department of Surgery, Prince of Wales Hospital, Chinese University of Hong Kong? Uh, he's the deputy director of the Combined Endolaparoscopy Center, Prince of Wales. A uh, board member and committee director of the Education and Training Committee, Asia Pacific Endolap Surgery Group, council member of Hong Kong Society of the Digestive Endoscopy, a core member of the Asian Novel Bioimaging and Intervention Group, the Stomach and Dudenal Disease Committee, World Endoscopy Organization, and Education Committee of the Asia Pacific, uh, Asia Pacific Society of Digestive Endoscopy. And Guidelines Committee, International Society of the Diseases of Esophagus. And to discuss us the perioral endoscopic myotomy, I would like to call on uh, Assistant Professor Hon Chi. Uh, okay. So, um, first of all, I would like to thank um, the kind invitation from Ellen and Ray uh, for me to come to this beautiful city of Manila to share experience on endolap surgery. So nicely following Ray's talk, um, I'll be slightly more focused on just poem procedure for achalasia. So I don't want to repeat what uh, Ray already said, but achalasia is the most common motility disorder. So of course, there are multiple options. So historically, surgery is one of the most important treatment. And there's, of course, some endoscopic treatment like uh, pneumatic dilatation. So indeed, um, POEM perhaps is the one of the first realization of the so-called NOTES procedure, natural orifice trans uh, luminal surgery, where we actually use an endoscope to get into the um, uh, into the lumen and beyond the lumen and perform some procedures that will significantly help the patient. So POEM um, stands for peroral endoscopic myotomy. Indeed, was first reported in the animal study in US, but first human was done by Professor Haruhiro Inoue um, from Japan in 2010. So the, the procedure involves in mucosal incision tunneling, a myotomy that with the length exactly almost the same with the surgical myotomy and finally closing it um, with just conventional clips. So realizing it that it's almost like a scarless procedure. So I'll very sh quickly show a video. Um, so this is almost like an uncut video. So I will need to fast forward. So um, this is a anterior myotomy. So we use um, a conventional uh, endoscope uh, with a cap. Uh, we use the TTJ knife. This is the original knife. Uh, well, the, the slightly modification of the original knife that was just described uh, to perform the procedure. So with um, injection into the submucosal space, and then you perform um, a, a tunneling and enter the tunnel. So, so if you do it right, actually, it's not difficult. So this is four times, but uncut video. So actually within like one minute's time, you enter the tunnel. And um, so Ray pointed out uh, very importantly, so we nowadays do not use epinephrine, especially in the esophagus, because if you put it epinephrine in the esophagus, it will be systemically as absorbed. And that, that will cause a lot of tachycardia or a cardiovascular effect to the patient. So this is what we want to avoid. So subsequently, you just create the tunnel and all the way down to the EG junction. So I will skip to make it faster. So near the EG junction, usually there will be much tighter space. So you'll need to um, uh, be more careful because one of the most important uh, thing to avoid is mucosal injury. So as opposed to say endoscopic resection where you need to protect the muscle to avoid perforation, here is an opposite idea. You protect the mucosa. You can do whatever you like to the muscle because you it's gonna be cut anyway. So this is a very important principle. So after that, of course, you get all the way down to the distal part, and then you will identify important structures to tell you that um, you're in the stomach. So uh, you measure the distance from the oral cavity. You know where the EG junction would be. You will identify some landmarks um, such as uh, spindle veins or such a sudden widening of the space because you enter the stomach from a tight EG junction, and also um, some of the muscle fiber may change. 
So after that, you start to perform a myotomy. So you see this is the tunneling being completed, and then you perform a myotomy. So um, actually, you can do a selective myotomy. You can also do a full thickness myotomy. So selective meaning you're only cutting the inner circular fibers. So you can see actually quite nicely, you see the longitudinal fibers. So for this particular case, what we did is we did a selective myotomy in the upper part. And then towards the distal part, we do a uh, complete myotomy. So we preserve initially this part of the um, uh, longitudinal fibers. And then towards the end, um, we cut all the way down uh, to expose the completely. So you see here, the, the longitudinal fibers are being splitted and we cut all the way down. So um, in a good procedure, I think usually this will take maybe um, less than an hour, about 30 to 45 minutes. And uh, finally, of course, um, you need to securely close the defect because this is a first simple incision. So um, there's no tissue defect, so it, it can easily be closed by using conventional endoscopic clips. So um, basically the outcome of POEMS, this, this is a meta-analysis um, systematic review showing early results that even in the old days, back in 2016, all the reports show that the general efficacy is super high. So 89 to 100%, so very effective procedure. And adverse event rate was quite low. So severe AE only in 1.2%, minor AE in 31%. Uh, so this is nowadays a very um, standardized reports of uh, uh, horn related complications. So in the past, air leakage was somehow being regarded as a complication or AE. But nowadays we all know that the gas in in inadvertently will go out. So it's not really a complication, but if you encounter mucosal defect, significant bleeding, um, pneumothorax or pro effusion, then these are more important complications that you'll be aware of, but they are actually generally quite rare. So indication of POEM nowadays, quite standardized. So of course, achalasia, um, it's quite important. And uh, some other spastic disorders are now being proposed um, to be used to be performed by POEM as well. And uh, from pediatric group to octogenarian group and also in advanced um, achalasia or also with patients um, who had failed previous treatments. So long-term outcomes are now currently being um, reported um, in multiple um, studies all across the world from China to, uh, to multinational um, database or U.S. So this is one of the more um, recent long-term outcome of more, more than six years follow-up showing that the clinical success remain very high at more than six years of follow-up. Although, as mentioned by Ray, symptomatic reflux seems to be one of the problem um, after POEM procedure. So how do we compare POEM with other existing modality? For example, so this is one of the study, a landmark study comparing pneumatic dilatation versus POEM. So with the primary outcome of treatment success at two years. So you can see that the green bar signifies success. Um, yellow bar signifies failure. So you can see the yellow bar is much less in the POEM group versus the um, pneumatic dilatation group indeed it translates um, to a treatment success of 92% versus 54%. Um, but of course, it all depends on how you interpret the data, and whether one dilatation is considered or it's twice or more than once are being considered as success or not. But overall treatment success again, so here you will see the big difference mainly because um, the failure rate is due to ECOT score more than three or retreatment being required in the pneumatic dilatation group. But again, um, similar to previous reports, reflux rate seems to be higher again after POEM. So, but with this trial, I think POEM has um, come up as the recommendation um, over pneumatic dilatation as the first line therapy. So then it finally comes up to this second trial, which compared the so-called gold standard of surgical myotomy, uh, multicenter non-inferiority RCT, um, aiming to show that um, the surgical procedure is equivalent to the endoscopic procedure. So it showed that there's actually some higher adverse event rate with uh, LHM, uh, Heller, uh, but again, reflux rate is higher, but overall clinical success, basically there is no difference. So it basically is an equivalent procedure, except for type three echolasia where POEM is better. So again, similarly, again, higher reflux rate um, with POEM, but probably only in the initial phase. You can see that at two years, seemingly the outcome were more or less comparable. 
So meta-analysis has shown similar data showing that um, clinical success rate were more or less comparable. Seemingly short-term data is better because there's less pain, shorter hospital stay, shorter procedural time. So even for sigmoidal esophagus, traditionally, of course, you won't do a HELA, but you may need a, a esophagectomy. But nowadays, there are proposals that a POEM may be a good option as an interim procedure um, because um, studies have found that even if you do a sigmoid uh, achalasia with POEM, um, comparing with non-sigmoid type achalasia, seemingly the outcome were more or less the same, signifying that you still have a good outcome even in patients have a, having a sigmoid um, esophagus. So, uh, of course, after failed myotomy, um, POEM has been investigated, showing quite satisfactory outcome as well. So, um, this is um, an LCT, small LCT, comparing pneumatic dilatation versus POEM after failed um, Heller myotomy. So, all the parameters um, show that POEM is preferred um, therapy for recurrent uh, patients. So basically nowadays in all the international guidelines, you will see the majority of them will conclude that the outcome of POEM is comparable with those of Heller. So it could be one of the first line treatment um, for patients with achalasia. So of course there are many things we need to consider technique wise about the procedure, which I mentioned slightly. So about short versus long myotomy. So you know that surgical concept is you need a five or six centimeters esophageal myotomy and two centimeters gastric myotomy. But people have been investigating whether you need a longer or shorter myotomy. And this um, paper from the Indian group actually show that with shorter myotomy, there's basically shorter procedural time, but no difference in any other outcomes, including clinical success rate. Similarly, another recent randomized trial um, published comparing long myotomy versus short myotomy with a slightly longer follow-up time, again, showing that there seems to be no difference in terms of the outcome um, comparing a long or short myotomy in terms of um, all the outcomes, including post poem GERD. And so they actually propose that um, a short esophageal myotomy might be non-inferior to long myotomy. So there's another consideration, whether you do it in an anterior stage or posterior stage. In theory, the posterior is easier to do because of the scope position as well as the instrument position. Um, so all the randomized, there, are, there have been three randomized trials being published, basically showing no difference um, in terms of short-term outcomes. There was one study from India, again from AIG, showing that there seems to be slightly higher reflux rate with posterior myotomy, which I will explain um, in the future. So um, also there has been proposal of using double scopes where that will help you to identify where the um, EGJ is and whether you have performed adequate uh, gastric myotomy. Um, but basically the, the use of double scope did not show in this RCT that it will increase the um, uh, procedural efficacy, but seems to have a slight implication of higher esophagitis afterwards. So this is the most important part. So. As I mentioned, GERD is the most um, important complication if you compare with Heller. So one of the main problem is that um, with POEM procedure, initially you will not be able to do any fundal application. So therefore there might be higher chance of reflux. And the other component of reflux is actually caused by sling fiber disruption. So sling fibers are actually fibers located around the EG junction, majority of them in the posterior side. Uh, it is one of the uh, important muscle that maintain the angle of his, um, that is one of the anti-reflux barrier. So preservation of the post uh, of the sling fibers may actually contribute to reduction in reflux. And the sling fibers is particularly obvious when you do a posterior poem. So if you do posterior poem and you do not preserve the sling fibers, actually you will have a higher risk of reflux. So so that's why. There have been proposal that you need to um, do when you do posterior poem, you need to find these two penetrating vessels and preserve the sling fibers on the left side and cut onto the right side where the circular muscles is located. So somewhat turning to the five o'clock region if you do a posterior poem. Um, there has been some study trying to look into the use of endoflip. So endoflip is a new t new kit um, in the block where you you actually will be able to measure the distensibility as well as the maximum diameter 
uh, by using a balloon um, catheter uh, put into the uh, esophagus. Uh, but I think at the moment, there's inadequate data to show whether or not this endoflip will transform to a better outcome of our poem procedure. So finally, a note about GERD. So um, basically from all the meta-analysis, it showed that seemingly GERD is higher than um, higher after surgery, a higher after poem than after surgery. Um, even in this um, multi-center study from Japan where the poem procedures originated, they still had a reflux esophagitis, endoscopic reflux of 64%, um, severe esophagitis of 7.5%, symptomatic reflux of 15.9%. So um, the statement from a multinational uh, group of experts actually proposed that we should standardize the technique, um, basically preserve the phrenical esophageal ligament, preserve oblique fibers, limit our gastric myotomy to two to three centimeters. Ultimately, with this, um, maybe you're able to reduce um, the reflux rate and maybe most of the patients do not require additional treatment. So um, as Ray mentioned, there has been some uh, uh, novel way trying to improve the reflux rate, which include the attempt of performing a fund application, uh, assimilating what surgical procedure can be done. Um, so this is called a POEM F procedure, where um, basically you're trying to get out and do a true peritoneoscopy and perform a fund application. So some initial studies um, from Japan and from India actually show that uh, seemingly it will be able to reduce this the posterior uh, the post skirt uh, poem skirt uh, rate. So this is one of the procedure done um, by ourselves. So similar to um, just now, so you perform a anterior myotomy um, all the way down to the EG junction, and after the myotomy, you try to excise outside. So you will actually see the diaphragmatic cruise from the inside, and then you incise the serosa on the gastric myotomy side or near the EG junction and then you cut out. So now it becomes a, a real peritoneoscopy because you will see the liver. So this is the left lobe of the liver outside. So um, a view that may be more familiar with us surgeons, uh, very scare, scare, scary for, for a gastroenterologist maybe. Uh, but anyway, so then you can go out, you see the liver, you turn left, you um, go up, you see the fundus, and then you see the spleen. You see the spleen over there. So you know that's the fundus. And then you will be able to grasp the fundus and pull it towards the site of your myotomy. And you see how the fundal or the wrap is being created when you use the double scope technique. So a, a, um, a nasal scope is now being placed in the center of the view. And you will see how the effect of pulling um, the, the fundus will be. And um, sorry. Sorry. So um so finally, so what you did, what we do, um, this is quite primitive, I must say. So we use clip and loop method to pull the fundus into the site of the myotomy to uh, maintain the flaps. And then uh finally you cut this uh, loop and um this is the effect. So you see a, a nice wrap, um anterior partial wrap being um, conducted. So um, this is data from ourselves. So we already completed a pilot study um, where we found that fund application would take another 45 minutes. Um, we succeeded in 11 out of the 12 cases. One had a bleeding, so we did not proceed to the, uh, to the fund application. And uh, it seems that when we compare to some of the data or in, of our own, there is um, a reduction, apparent reduction in terms of the um, severe, more severe uh, esophagitis or the GERD, objective GERD based on the latest Leon consensus. And uh, using the uh, endoflip, we did see a change in the distensibility index um, before myotomy, after myotomy, and then after fund application. So uh, we're now performing a randomized trial, a multinational randomized trial, and hopefully we will be able to show the data in the coming few years. So ladies and gentlemen, I would like to conclude that um, POEM is now a well-established method for achalasia and its preferred method to treat recurrent disease. And there's now currently trend towards a tailored 
myotomy, where maybe a shoulder myotomy is um, desirable, and it's also applied in non-achalasia motility disorders. And we have to bear in mind that a gastric myotomy um, should be uh, limited to less than two centimeters or two to three centimeters to avoid reflux. And there are some uh, novel ideas trying to um, reduce the uh, chance of reflux after poem procedure, uh, but we need more data to be confirmed. So with that, I would like to conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Yi. Any questions from our audience? Very nice. From poem to poem to duplication. We have a question. Actually, both uh, presenter could, uh, I know, it's from Zoom. Phone in uh, Zoom in question. So, Andre Irawan, I don't know from where. Uh, thank you, Professor, for both Dr. Ray and Dr. Yip. Um, I want to ask how many centimeters length do you perform myotomy? What is your recommendation? Thank you. Um, maybe I will start uh, and then Ray supplement if you need. <laughs> Why are you looking at me like that? <laughs> well, I guess the point here is nowadays um, there are different beliefs. Uh, in the past, when we're not so familiar with HLMs, which I think the later speaker will give us more information. So the standard myotomy of for esophagus will be five centimeters to six centimeters, and then two centimeters myotomy in the gastric side. So you need to be very specific about esophagus and gastric myotomy, okay? Um, this is more or less standard nowadays for type 1 or type 2 achalasia. But type 3, you will know that it's more a spastic type procedure. So now, whether or not you need to extend the myotomy. So if you're doing surgical procedure, it's very hard because your limit is transhiatal. So how high you can go is very limited. But because nowadays we have POEM, basically you can cut from the UES all the way down to the LES if you want to. However... Nowadays, what we do is we rely on the accurate prediction by the HRM because HRM actually helps you to understand the spastic segment. And then you use that as a guide for you to try and cut the spastic segment. So if the spastic segment lengthens, then you can do a longer myotomy. So, well, if you do not have that guide, usually people say 10 centimeter esophageal myotomy for type three. But I think nowadays, maybe a tailored myotomy will be a, one of the way to go. In sigmoid type esophagus for POEM procedure, we only do a short myotomy. Because if you have a long, tortuous esophagus, imagine doing a tunnel there, that means you'll be, lose, you'll be losing your way easily. So just doing a short myotomy is adequate. And also think about the pathophysiology. With such a dilated tortuous esophagus, what's the point of cutting the muscle? It's already so dilated. So all you need is to target the LES where the stenosis or the or the narrow part is. And so that's a concept for um, sigmoidal type of achalasia. So that that's what um, I would say. Okay. Uh, Hanchi, I don't think I will be able to add anything to that um, question, but I think uh, my question would be, I'd like to ask a question would be, um, the type of um, uh, fund duplication that you mm. uh, use if you do your open, I mean, right. your laparoscopic surgeries. Okay. So um, I think there, had, there, there has been a lot of debate um, about the role of fund application in the surgical, after a surgical procedure. So I think the consensus nowadays is that, first of all, so we can divide the wrap into a complete wrap or a partial wrap. Okay, so um, complete wrap meaning an descent, partial wrap can be any type. So the consensus is that a complete wrap after a halomatomy is not that desirable because studies or a randomized trial comparing complete versus partial wrap has found that there's a high incidence of dysphagia with a complete wrap. Now with partial wrap, again, there are so many options. You can do a partial anterior, partial posterior, whatever degree you like to do. Um, maybe we will have more talks about it during the fundal talk. Uh, but nowadays, I think the consensus is you can do a partial, whichever you like, because studies did not find any difference between an anterior or posterior. For my preference, we do a more anterior rep because what we can do is we don't know, we, we actually do not need to dissect posterior. And the more you dissect, 
the more you disrupt the anti reflux barrier, indeed. So, what we do is do an anterior wrap. You just pull the fundus. If you need to mobilize a little bit, you can mobilize a little bit, but you don't need to, you don't necessarily need to. But as very nicely shown in the video, you just cover it up. And that helps also if you have some unknown mucosal injury that will maybe help you to protect any mucosal injury um, to, to expose into a, a real leakage. So, so that's my approach um, for that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dr. Benafe, Dr. Rosella, anything? Okay. Uh, they, okay. So we need some more coffee here. Yeah. <laughs> so um, um, uh, we do picture taking. Uh, before we go for the next uh, picture taking upstairs. Okay. Okay. So before we go to the next session, uh, we do. Let's do. Uh, we need to go to this. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, maybe last question. Yes. Uh, for sigmoidal, so far, <laughs> sigmoidal uh, esophagus after, I mean, a patient with achalasia, do you go for uh, esophagectomy or like a stage for uh, achalasia? Would you go for an esophagectomy or, I mean, since you're very, I mean, poem is uh, done left and right in your institution, would you go for? So um, for us, uh, in a patient who presented with a sigmoid esophagus or an end stage achalasia, um, actually, sometimes we do rely on um, investigational results. So ultimately, what you want to know is whether the symptom is correlating with an LES obstruction or not. So if, a, if it is um, a native um, sigmoid type without any prior treatment, usually we still offer an, a chance of a myotomy via a POEM procedure first because ultimately doing it is a vajectomy is quite a major undertaking for the patient. And usually, in honestly, it takes them six months at least to consider the option of surgery. And in that time, why not just do a poem procedure and see if it helps? So that's my that's our uh, concept nowadays. Okay. Thank you.